sorry thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword my flesh. The thoughts, the slaves of life, and life time's fool, and time that takes survey of all the world, must have a stop. Oh, I could prophesy. but that the earthy and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust, and food But then, in March last year, the school had a sponsored swim, and the kids were going to swim the length of the pool. And I promised I was going to watch her, but I got, I was late, out of work, and I was only going to be there in time to meet her afterwards, but when I got there, there was an ambulance, and I thought, like, the pools in the central remedial clinic, so I thought it was just somebody being dropped there. I didn't really pay any attention. But when I got in, I saw there was no one in the pool. One of the teachers was there with a group of kids. And she was crying. Some of the children were crying. And this woman, another one of the mums, comes over and says that there's been an accident. And Eve had hit her head in the pool. And she'd been in the water. And they've been trying to resuscitate her. But she was going to be all right. And I didn't believe it was happening. I thought it must have been someone else. And I went into, I was, I was brought into a room. And Neve was on a table. It was a table for table tennis. And an ambulance man was giving her the Kiss of life. She was in her bathing suit. And the ambulance man said he didn't think what he was doing was working. And he didn't know she was alive. And he wrapped her in a towel and carried her out to the ambulance. Once there were brook trout in the streams in the mountains, he could see them standing in the amber current, where the white edges of their fins wimpled softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand, polished and muscular and torsional. On their backs were vermiculite patterns that were maps of the world and its becoming. Maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back, not be made right again. In the deep glens where they lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. A, a heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege, and all unlooked for from your highness's mouth. A, a dearer merit, not so deep a maim, as to be cast forth into the common air of I deserved at your highness's hands. The language I've learned these 40 years, my native English, now I must forego. My tongue has no use for me now than an unstringed viol or a harp. Too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence then but speechless death, which robs my tongue of breathing native breath? Breaking the poor girl's heart. Uh, you get older and you look back on what you did things and you see that a lot of the time there wasn't a reason. 
They do a lot of things out of pure cussedness. I stop answering her letters, and I'd fucking dread one coming to the house. And her and I'm wondering how I was, and was there something wrong with the post or this? I can't explain what carry on I was up to. I had just left her out. Being the big fella, me dad handing over the business to me, man of substance, swanning around. And then I had the goal to feel resentful when she wrote me and said she was getting married to a fella. And I was thought that it was her fault for going up in the first place. There was a delegation of people from all around here going to the wedding on a bus. And I was just one of the crowd, just one of the guests. In my suit, my shoes nearly polished off me. And a hangover like you wouldn't believe. I've been up until five or more. So in this stuff, staring at the fire. And we're all on the bus at nine. And all the chat all around was why she had to come home to get married. And me, sick as a dog. <laughs> the smell of bro cream off all his coaches. Sitting in the church in Fisboro. All her lovely looking nurse friends and her guard boyfriends. She was marrying a guard. Huge fella. Shoulders like a big gorilla. And they were coming down the aisle after and I caught her eye and gave her the cheesiest little grin you've ever seen. <laughs> a little grin that was saying, enjoy your big gorilla because the future is all ahead of me. And she just looked at me like I was only another guest at the wedding. And that was that. And the future was all ahead of me. Years and years of it. All those things you got to face on your own, all by yourself. And you bear it because you're showing everybody you're a great fellow altogether. I have resisted this for years. Writing to you as if you could hear me. It was always different with my father. We always had a kind of rhetoric between us, a kind of battle. It didn't matter if one of us was alive or one of us was dead. But you, I have wanted to protect your existence. I haven't wanted to use it as a theme in a poem or a tragic musing. I wanted you to dwell in the minds of those who had reason to miss you. Their own, yours, not mine. The living, writers especially, are terrible projectionists. I hate the way that we use the dead. But I cannot end this without speaking to you, not merely of you. You knew, you knew even in 1953 that there was more to it than food and humor. But even as you said it, I knew this was just a formula that you used to put between yourself and your pain. Apparitions are, so to speak, shreds and fragments of other worlds, the first beginnings of them. There is, of course, no reason why a healthy man should see them, for a healthy man is mainly a being of this earth, and therefore, for completeness and order, he must live only this earthly life. But as soon as he falls ill, as soon as the normal earthly state of the organism disturbed. Possibility of a new world begins to appear. And as the illness increases, so do the contacts with the other world. So that at the moment of a man's death, he enters fully into that world. But I left the church like a little boy. And I walked away. I couldn't go to the reception. I just kept walking. It was a light rain, I just kept walking. And then I was in town. It was a dark day, like there was a roof on the city. And I found myself in a little labyrinth of streets with nothing doing and I ducked into a pub. A little dark place, just one or two others there. Business like barman. Like yourself, Bernard, huh? Business like 
beautiful. And I put a pun or two away, and a small one or two, and I sat there, just looking down at the dirty wooden bar. And the barman asked me if I was all right. Simple little question. And I said I was. And he said he'd make me a sandwich. And I said, okay. And I nearly started crying because, you know, here was someone just, and I watched him. He took two slices off a fresh loaf and buttered them carefully, spreading it all around. I'll never forget it. And then he sliced some cheese and cooked ham and an onion out of a jar. He put it all on a plate and sliced it down the middle. And just someone doing this for me and putting it down in front of me. Get that down, you know, he said. Then he folded up his newspaper and put on his jacket and went off on his break. There was another barman then. slanted brook that shows his hoar leaves in glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples, which liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do call dead men's fingers. There on the pendant boughs her cornet weeds, clambering to hang an envious sliver broke, when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide and mermaid like a while they bore her up which times she chanted snatches of old lauds as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature native and endued into that element. But long it could not be to let her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Not a wit, we defy augury. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Hmm. And I got in the back with him. They radioed on ahead. They were going to put her on a machine in Beaumont and try to revive her there. But the ambulance man knew, I think. She wasn't breathing, and he just knew. And he said if I wanted to say goodbye to her in the ambulance, in case I didn't get a chance to at the hospital. And I gave her a little hug. She was freezing cold. Mammy loved her very much. She just looked asleep. But her lips had gone blue. She was dead. And it had happened so fast. Just a few minutes. And I don't think I have to tell you how hard it was. Between me and Daniel as well. It didn't seem real. At the funeral, I just thought I could go lift her out of the coffin and it would be the end of this. I think Daniel was... I don't know if he actually blamed me. There was nothing I could do. But he became very busy in his work, just keeping to himself. And But I was, you know, I was more... I just didn't really know what I was doing. Just walking around, wanting to sitting in the house with Daniel's mother fussing about the place. Just months of this, not really talking about it, like... But then, one morning I was in bed. Daniel had gone to work. I usually lay there for a few hours trying to 
Stay asleep, I suppose. And the phone rang, and I just left it. I wasn't going to get it. And it rang for a long time. Young Prince Hamlet, the only flower of Denmark, is bereft of all the wealth he had. The jewel which adorned his feature most is filched and stolen away. His wits bereft him. He found me walking in a gallery all alone, and there comes he to me with distracted look, his garters lagging down, his shoes untied, and fixed his eyes so steadfast on my face, as though they vowed this is their latest object. A small while he stood, but grips me by the wrist, and there he holds my pulse, till with a sigh he doth unclasp his hand and parts away, silent as is the mid-time of the night. And as he went, his eye was still on me, for his head over his shoulder looked. He seemed to find the way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their help. And so did leave me. You're old. You can't pretend anymore. No getting away from it this time. Your life is over. All those years down the drain, just like that. And it won't come back. The bottle's almost empty. Just a little bit left at the bottom. Dregs, that's what it is. Ready or not, it's time for your final roll. The death scene. The Undiscovered Born. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, Everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let go, to let it go. When I took the sandwich up, I could hardly swallow it because of the lump in my throat. But I ate it all down because someone I didn't know had done this for me. Such a small thing, but a huge thing in my condition. It fortified me like no meal I ever had in my life. And I went to the reception. I was properly ashamed of myself. There was a humility I've tried to find since, but goodness wears off, and it just gets easier to be a contrary bollocks. garage, spending small jobs out all day, taking hours to fix a puncture. Stops you thinking about what might have been or what you should have done. It's like looking away, like I did at the reception. You should only catch someone's eye for the right reason. And I'll tell you, there's not one morning I don't wake up with her name in the room. And I do be at this fella, don't I? Yep. I may be on my way now. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word.
tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays lighted fools the way to dusty death out out brief candle life's but a walking shadow a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing alone will sing like birds in the cage when thou dost ask me blessing i'll kneel before thee and ask thee forgiveness and will live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news and we'll talk with them too who loses and who wins who's in and who's out and take upon the mystery of things as if we were god's spies and we'll wear out in a walled prison, packed in sects of great ones that have been flow by the moon. Behold your king of wrong, wrong-headed on the throne, wrong-headed in the home, wrong-footed by the heavens. And you, dear son, dead son, I was wrong to harry you. The hammer blow of justice has caught and brought me low. I am under the wheels of the world, smashed to bits by a god. What can be worse than worst? What has happened now? Why am I cramped like prey in the hungry jaws of death? I am a kill that death has made and attacked for a second time. Why doesn't someone take a two-edged sword to me? The dark is on me too. I am at bay in guilt and grief. Let every verdict be pronounced against me. She was guiltless. It was my hand on the hilt, my hand that drove the blade. Take me out of your sight. I'm nothing now. Forget me. Treat me as nothing. Oh, I die, Horatio. The potent poison quite o'ercrows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England, yet I do prophesy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. So tell him, with the occurrence more and less which I have solicited. The rest is silence. Many things strange, terrible, clever, wondrous, monstrous, marvelous, dreadful, awful, and weird there are in the world, but none more strange, terrible, clever, uncanny, wondrous, monstrous, marvelous, dreadful, awful, and weird than man. He sails across the sea in blasting winter. He plows the inexhaustible earth year after year. The race of birds, 
the tribes of beasts, the underwater creatures, all. He drives into his net this clever man. He masters animals that roam the hills and puts wild horses to the yoke or mountain bulls. He uses thought and language and the tempering of these. He knows to shelter from the frost and rain and how to shun disease. He answers every question put to him. Every question put to him but one. To death he has no answer. From death he finds no exit. The freshly cut pumpernickel on which we lobbed our lox and cream cheese the radishes, the kosher dill pickles, the onion rolls. You said these were remnants of culture. Even the fresh challah that went stale so quickly. It was so beautiful. And that is why I want to speak to you now. To say that no one who is taking responsibility for his or her identity should ever be made to feel so alone. That there have to be those with whom we can sit down and weep and still be counted as warriors. I think you believed that there was no place for you then. And maybe there wasn't. And maybe there isn't now. But we will have to make this place. We who want to make an end to this suffering, who want to change the laws of history, if we are not to give ourselves away, I've been an actor all my life, and this is the first time I've been on stage in the middle of the night. Yes, the first time. Curious. It's so dark out there. Can't see a thing. The prompter's box, a little. The stage boxes. But all the rest is darkness, a bottomless black hole. Just like the grave and death out there, waiting. If I stay here the rest of the night, I'll die. I'll die. And eventually it stopped and I was dropping off again, but then it started ringing again for a long time. So I thought it must have been Daniel trying to get to me, somebody who knew I was there. So I went down and answered it. The line was very faint. It was like a crossed line. There were voices, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. And then I heard Neve. She said, Mommy. And I just said, you know, yes. And she said, she said she wanted me to come and collect her. I mean, I wasn't sure whether this was a dream or leaving, or leaving us had been a dream. I just said, where are you? She said she was at Nana's in the bedroom, but Nana wasn't there and she was scared. Because there were children knocking in the wall 
And there was a man standing across the road. And he was looking up and he was going to cross the road. And when I come and get her. And I said, I would. I would, of course I would. And I dropped the phone and I ran out to the car in a t-shirt. And I drove to Daniel's mother's house. I could hardly see. I was crying so much. I mean, I knew she wasn't going to be there. I knew she was gone. But to think wherever she was, that And there was nothing I could do about it. Daniel's mother got a doctor, and I slept for a day or two. But it was... Daniel felt that I needed to face up to Neve being gone. But I thought he should face up for what happened to me. He was insisting that I get some treatment, and then everything would be okay. But, you know, what can help that? If she's out there, she's still... She still needs me. I hurt her. Ah, oh, Faustus. Now hast thou but one bare hour to live. And then thou must be damned perpetually. Stand still, you ever-moving spheres of heaven, that time may cease and midnight never come. Fair nature's eye, rise, rise again and make perpetual day. Or let this hour be but a year, a month, a week, a natural day, that Faustus may repent and save his soul. O lente, lente curate nocti qui. The stars move still, time runs, the clock will strike, the devil will come, and Faustus must be damned. <laughs> <laughs>